Well, this year I am getting all set up to teach kindergarten. I work in Ontario, Canada, where we have a play-based kindergarten program. It's a two-year program, so instead of junior kindergarten and senior kindergarten, they're all put together into a two-year program, and I work with an early childhood educator to deliver a play-based learning program for students. And so a few years ago, I was also supposed to teach kindergarten. That is, that didn't work out. That's a story for another day. But I would watch YouTube videos and follow Instagram accounts to learn more about how people were setting up their classroom, what they were doing. And what I found was that there was a huge range in terms of what people considered play-based. For some people, it was what I have experienced where everything is done through play. And in other schools and school districts, it was really um, minimal in terms of what I'm used to. So maybe 10 minutes of free play at the end of the day or using games as a way of learning and apps on computers instead of just worksheets. And so it seemed like there was a really wide range of what is considered play-based learning. And so that is what I wanted to share with you today. Now, since finding all of these wonderful teachers on YouTube and Instagram, I have started my own Instagram account. Feel free to go follow me over there. And that is where I will share more of my day-to-day -day teaching um, and sort of what we're doing in my classroom as opposed to over here where I'm sharing more of the research-based and longer types of content with you. Well, hello, I'm Courtney. Welcome to my channel where we discuss educational research one study at a time so that you can incorporate it into your practice. Today, the study that I am going to share with you is called Play-Based Learning, Evidence-Based Research to Improve Children's Learning Experiences in the Kindergarten Classroom. It was published in 2020 from the Early Childhood Education Journal. This article is more of a review of literature compared to a traditional study, and so the authors take a look at what the research shows in terms of historical uses of play-based learning, where the concepts of early learning and play come into place, a continuum of play-based learning in classrooms, and then at the end they reflect on what this means for our practice going forward as educators. And so we're going to start off with the theory and history around play-based learning. And so if you remember Teachers College, I'm going to say a few philosopher names that might be, I hate the word triggering, but might cause a visceral response from how many projects you had to do about these people. So take a deep breath, get ready for it. Piaget and Vygotsky, they're back. We cannot escape them. Leave a comment down below if you have had enough of Piaget and Vygotsky for a lifetime. I'm sorry for bringing it up again. It's not me, I'm just the messenger. It's in this article. So in order to explore play-based learning, the authors had to look at the theoretical pioneers behind learning and play coming together. And so with Piaget, remember that is uh, the theories of cognitive development and how children move through predictable developmental stages in order to learn. And if we look at Vygotsky, that is all about sociocultural theory. And so that suggests that students, children, make meaning of their own learning and their own world around them based on the culture that they're in. And so there's an interplay there. And remember, culture doesn't necessarily refer to different countries and the norms and values of each country or geographic area. It can refer to any subset of people who share common values and practices. So you can work to develop an, your own culture in your own classroom or a culture of a school. And then the authors also look to historical conceptions of play-based learning in childhood. And so they refer to Frederick Froebel, who is the father of kindergarten, who wanted to create a child's paradise for children and gave all of the uh, little children a plot of land, a garden, kindergarten, a garden of children, gave them a plot of land to tend to and take care of. And that was sort of how this idea of kindergarten came into play, where we can be working and learning and growing and having fun all at the same time. Then the authors turned to Rudolf Steiner, who was really big into sensory play and particularly bringing in pieces from the natural world to play in. So this is where we have the ideas of those natural playgrounds that are coming into place where it's play on logs and they play with sticks and rocks and touch the grass and the outdoor area is 
all the sensory input that you would need your own local outdoor area and then Maria Montessori was really focused on having children really engage in the work that they were doing and the play that they were involved in and using that focus and that engagement to become contributing members of society. An area that I think this article could benefit from that was not included was that the philosophies and the historical approaches that were used were very, you know, Eurocentric, North American valued. I would suspect that if we looked further, we would find historical value for play-based learning widely used in other cultures and subcultures across the world. And so this is a very Eurocentric idea that's being perpetuated and it's sort of being seen as, you know, wow, look, look what we just discovered. Kids should play and learn that way. Whereas I'm sure if you looked on a more global scale, um, that would likely already be well established and well documented and not this new novel thing that we are putting into curriculum. To learn more about the types of play and play-based learning that exist, the authors turned to work by Pyle and Daniels from 2017 and Piles and Daniels created a continuum of play-based learning. And so on the far left, we have free play, which is children playing as they normally would, little to no adult involvement or interaction. Children are free to play and create and lead their own play without any kind of intervention. Then moving a little bit more to the right, but still on the left is inquiry play. And in this type of play, an adult would help extend the play that a child is engaged in based on the child's interests. So for example, a wonderful, wonderful teacher friend of mine noticed that her students were really into digging up rocks outside and trying to pretend that they were archeologists. And so she brought out little paintbrushes and little tiny cups of water so that they could brush away all of the dirt off the rocks and really examine them closely. So that would be inquiry play. It's still child led. She didn't say, let's go learn about rocks today. They said that they were really interested in seeing the rocks closer. And so she was providing the tools and the space and the opportunity for them to continue on with what they were interested in. Then in the middle, we have collaboratively designed play or collaborative play. And this is where teachers provide themes or uh, contexts for children to learn in based on their own interests. And teachers extend the learning through activities that they put in that they're hoping students will take up and in and reinforce some some learning skills there so for example this is where we see the dramatic play center transform into a restaurant because students talked about going to a restaurant the night before and the teacher might put little notebooks in there so that students can write and the teachers might pop into the little restaurant and say oh can i order something i have some money here and help the students count it out so the teacher is really involved in this type of play and the teacher can take academic standards and try and position them in the play context that have been created. Then a little bit more to the right, there's playful learning. And so this is where teachers don't take up the interests of the students. It's very teacher directed in the sense that the teacher is deciding what is going to be taught, what needs to be learned, but they deliver the content in a playful way. So instead of doing a worksheet about addition, a teacher might bring out some toys and they might create a little story together with the students. And in that story, they have to act out some kind of addition story. So, you know, this puppet wants to have a slice of pizza. Let's split up the pizza evenly between all of the friends. Let's count the number of pizzas and go from there. So it's playful. We're still using materials to play with, but it is still very teacher directed and standards focused. Finally, on the far right, we have games. And in games, it's exactly like it sounds. The teacher is directing a concept or skill that needs to be taught and reinforced and using a game for the student to learn that concept and practice a skill. And so it could be a, a board game, it could be a game on an app, it could be a dramatic play game, but it's learning through a game where there's some sense of strategy and winning associated with it. One important thing to note about this article is that after describing the types of play, the authors explain that the collaborative play is the optimal area for learning to take place in a play-based classroom. However, they don't cite this. 
So I don't know if the authors are speculating based on what they've read or if they just forgot to cite and this information is coming from someplace or if they looked at the findings from a whole bunch of other studies and drew a um, objective conclusion based on that. There's not enough information in that paragraph for me to fully know if collaborative play is in fact the most optimal way for learning to take place. It makes sense that it could be, but I don't have enough research-based information to know if that is a true claim or not. The authors then go on to talk about the social and academic skills of play-based learning. So with social skills, we have, you know, oral language development, learning to take turns, learning to collaborate, learning to regulate your emotions, learning to regulate your behavior around play, learning cause and effect with consequences and how you interact with other students and children around you and building up a more extensive um, vocabulary and rhythm to conversational text because there's so much talking that goes on when you play. In terms of academic benefits, children tend to learn more math-based skills through the concrete materials that they play with because they have to share them amongst people, they have to add things to it. Um, there's, you know, geometry and and the shape of different materials and so math skills tend to come in through concrete materials that get played with and then in symbolic play so where children are acting things out or like using toys that don't necessarily have a purpose assigning a purpose to them when they play so this rock is actually a doll and this is my baby and i love it that is symbolic play that is where you get more language development skills and so that's where they build a lot more verbal comprehension and expressive language abilities is through that symbolic play and then the authors talk about the educator role in play and so educators are influenced by their own ideas of what play-based learning is and that's what they put out in the classroom i would also suggest that they're probably influenced by the curriculum and the expectations by their school district that determine what they have to do because you have to work within the scope of what you're allowed to do, regardless of your values sometimes. And then the authors also talked about how the way that educators show their values for play is how the students perceive the value of play connected to learning. And so if we want children to see play as learning, then we need to model that and develop that culturally in our own classroom. When it comes to structuring play, the authors talk about teachers extending learning and when teachers put a lot of effort into extending learning opportunities for students, the type of play that a student engages in can, can really be developed because they'll play longer and they'll play more intricately. So they go into a lot more detail with their play if an adult comes in and offers some meaningful, purposeful extensions. Not just coming in and <laughs> changing the whole game, but really building on what the students are already doing. When it comes to assessment, the authors looked to research that showed that there is a mismatch in what teachers are assessing and what they're promoting in play-based activities. So the authors recommend that teachers develop a sense of play as learning first and then select tools that would be appropriate to capturing what's already taking place in the classroom rather than coming up with an assessment before you even know what play is going to look like in your classroom and how it's going to unfold for your own students. Then the others talk about using technology and different apps on iPads and computers to promote play in the classroom. They didn't talk about what specific apps were used and where these apps fall in terms of being on that continuum. I mean, I can go look up the study. I should probably read the study that they cited just to get more understanding there. But I would suspect that the, the apps in terms of play-based learning and the, the technological side of play would fall more under playful learning or games learning from just from what I've seen of educational apps and games on computers and on tablets. Finally, the authors offer their takeaways from the research that they present in this article. And so the first takeaway is that learning can become more intentional and purposeful depending on how teachers implement play in their classroom and depending on the values that they assign to play 
in their classroom. So it's important to provide students experience in taking turns, in having routines associated with play, in terms of problem solving, so that play can really be maximized for everybody in the classroom. The second takeaway that the authors suggest is that teachers become more involved in children's play by asking important thought-provoking questions to students to help extend their learning so that students play for a longer time and so that their play can become more um, more intentional and more intricate. My own personal takeaways from this article are that I'm really reflecting especially on that continuum of play because as it shows not all play is the same and the teacher has a lot of power in what type of play gets put in the classroom. Um, I think I do tend to lean more to the left in terms of play-based learning um, and so I'm really thinking about what areas can benefit the most from very open-ended play and what areas might benefit from more structured play activities or playful learning. I do like that word, playful, because it it's not necessarily directed by the student, but it is still enjoyable for students. And so I will be reflecting on that, especially in terms of the potential to pivot. So right now we're in a big will we, won't we with going online. We are scheduled to start in person but at any moment in this world, we could be remote. And so I'm really reflecting on how do I promote my values of play as learning in a remote setting. So if you have experience with that, uh, the good, the bad, the, the it is what it is experience, please feel free to leave that in the comments so that we can all learn from your experience as well. As I reflect on how I want to incorporate play into my kindergarten classroom, I've really been enjoying following along with Passionately Curious Educators. They have a website and they're also on Instagram and they do webinars and things like that. It's actually, it's co-run by two educators and one of them was actually my camp coordinator when I was a teenager and I was a camp counselor. She was my, my boss. However, I think even if I didn't know her, I would still be fully along for their journey because they are, I mean it's in their name, they are passionate about play and how, how, you know, how to incorporate play and make it really valuable in the classroom and make it meaningful. And so it's been, I've been following them for a few years now and I've always wanted to teach kindergarten so I could implement some of the things that they talk about. And so if you are wanting to do more play as learning in your classroom, feel free to go ahead and give them a follow because they have a lot of really great practical ideas and great philosophies that can sort of help you get in the mindset for what that actually looks like in a classroom. Well, that is all I have for you today. Don't forget to give this video a thumbs up and share it with some of your educator friends so that YouTube knows to send my videos out to more people. Thank you so much for watching and have a great day. Bye now.